divorce and the people of God this will be I'm thinking two weeks anyways and what I'm saying to you now isn't in your notes so you don't have to worry about that right now what makes subjects like this about the hardest thing pastors ever have to deal with And I mean deal with in a teaching setting like this. Is Christians tend to polarize around the issues of of holiness and grace. Holiness and grace. The issue that's not easily uh, grasped is... What effect does God's grace have on situations like we'll be considering tonight? And I'm going to try real hard to show you both sides of this issue. You you confront the bare command of God, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New. The, The bare command of God that just says, don't divorce. So, It's really not hard to know what's right here. I mean, it's not complicated. It's not rocket science. We we see what the Word says. We, I think, know God's will. What makes it hard is, what, what effect does grace have? What effect does grace have on, here's a person who is in a difficult situation, uh, maybe 
two people were unsaved and one got saved and now you've got a Christian and a non-Christian, maybe in a very difficult situation. And so one partner or the other wants out. And so here's, here's a marriage where divorce is being contemplated. Okay, what, what, my question is, what effect does God's grace have? The divorce rate, by the way, among Christians is almost identical with the world. There's virtually no difference. It's, it's approaching one in two. In other words, when you come to Cedar View for a wedding, I'm not talking about out there somewhere, right here, when you see someone, a pastor standing, marrying people, the odds of those people divorcing are good. About 50% of the time, somewhere down the road. Okay, what, what effect does God's grace have? How does it enter that situation where people are pondering that step of divorce? What does grace do? God's grace. What does God's grace do? Situations where people are divorced, have been divorced for years. They come into a church like this. What effect does God's grace have there? Because here's what I I see sometimes happening, and it gets it exactly backwards. Sometimes here's a couple contemplating divorce, and they hear about God's grace, and it makes them think that they'll be fine and it won't matter that much if they get a divorce. And then here's a couple that are already divorced, Maybe years ago, and they've, they're coming into the church and, and they're, they're serving the Lord and they hear teaching from someone on the subject of divorce and they just, and they feel condemnation and guilt. Somehow like second-rate Christians. I don't know, should I be a member? Should I teach Sunday school? Should I? And I, and I, and I see this over and over again. It's very hard to deal wisely pastorally where what I want to say is God's grace should come to this couple who are considering divorce, and God's grace should come and increase a desire to stay together. It should increase conviction that divorce is not the way to go. And God's grace should come to this couple who are living with condemnation, and it should, and it should help them know that there is now no condemnation, therefore, to those who are in Christ Jesus. That they're, that they're forgiven sinners like I'm a forgiven sinner. Different sins but all things are made new. And my concern is when the exact flip-flop happens and, and someone here who just says, I'm getting out of this marriage, and after all, God will forgive me. And God's grace didn't work the way it's supposed to work in that situation. And this Christian couple here who are desperately trying to follow Jesus and have had someone come and just thump them with you know, Matthew 19 or something, and then they just feel like, I'm no good. I must be living in a state of adultery. And they feel guilt and condemnation. And I look at that and I say, this is exactly backwards. This is exactly the wrong way grace should affect each situation. And so how do you deal pastorally with with the seriousness of God's command for people who aren't yet committing that sin and yet with the love and tenderness of our Lord to people who are already through that situation? Do you get what I'm saying? That's the issue. We're going to spend a couple of weeks on this topic. We're going to start with the text of Malachi chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Malachi 2, 11 and 12. And we'll just kind of get into the subject tonight and there'll be more on this next week and there'll be study notes as well. Marriage, divorce, and the people of God, Malachi 2.11. Judah has been faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. 
May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendants of a man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Now, there are two sins, just so you don't get confused. You say, well, what, what? that text doesn't even talk about divorce, Pastor Don. Two sins are dealt with in the next six verses of chapter 2. The first has to do with entering marriage. That's what we're looking at tonight. The second has to do with getting out of marriage. The first has to do with marrying pagan, in this case, pagan wives. In our, in our society, a pagan spouse, a, a godless spouse, an unbeliever. And the second has to do with forsaking and divorcing a wife after many years of marriage. Now, here it talks about a man divorcing his wife all through the Old Testament for the simple reason that a woman couldn't divorce her husband. I'm sorry, it's just the way it was. So, so the man was the one who would initiate divorce. So that's why it's worded that way. But it applies to both situations. It's hard teaching from a text like this. It's hard addressing subjects like this in today's church. And it's hard because both the Bible and our Lord Jesus himself approach the subject of human sin and failure from two perspectives. First, there's a standard, uh, a law, a command, a standard of holiness that's made clear in God's word. Teaching is laid out. Commandments are given. Examples, patterns are set down to be noticed and learned from. Warnings are issued. What the consequences will be if the commandment is broken. Okay, that's the first perspective, and it's there in the Word of God. The second perspective is unbelievable, creative, renewing grace is offered to those who will repent of their sin and turn to Christ. None of us as sinners, gets what he or she deserves. And everyone said, Whew, that's what everybody said. Jesus bears the penalty of our guilt. Jesus bears the penalty of our rebellion. And so people get offered new hope. They're set back on their feet. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The psalmist, even in the Old Testament, the psalmist catches just a glimpse of this kind of miraculous grace when he says, He, God, has not dealt with us after our iniquities. We don't get justice from God. We get pardon from God. We get mercy. We get a clean slate. Now, like I said just a minute ago, holding these two perspectives, seriously seeing what God commands about a situation and appreciating what grace does with those who are guilty. Holding those two perspectives is the hardest job by far in the pastoral ministry of any church. And it's hard because Christians, sincere, devout, passionate Christians, tend to line up in only one camp or only in the other camp. And there are real dangers in proclaiming one side of God's truth without the other. Like an airplane. Two wings. If you're mid-flight over the Atlantic and one of them comes off, you're in trouble. You just need both wings. And the church needs both sides of this message. But it doesn't tend to work that way. It takes a very uh, serious thinking, godly-minded, mature body of believers to, to recognize the whole of what Scripture says on a difficult subject like this. Because what happens is there are those who just proclaim the holiness of God. I mean, I've encountered that. And I believe in the holiness of God pretty seriously. And they have their watchword. This is what the word teaches. This is the unchanging standard of God. If you just go around preaching easy grace, people won't care much about obedience. They'll just sin as much as they like. And then they'll ask God's forgiveness and fooey on holiness. That's what will happen if you start just telling people 
They're just forgiven for anything and everything they do. So above all else, the standard of holiness must be protected. God doesn't compromise, and so the church shouldn't compromise. And I think most of us, I would say, amen. It's true. Then there are those who see all the broken lives, who have already missed God's teaching and broken his command and they want so badly to reach out to them in grace that they no longer preach what the Bible says because it's just going to be offensive to people and actually they no longer believe that it matters very much whether God is obeyed or not God is love that's the banner that's the watchword Grace can easily become just some kind of sentimental, convenient rinse for just doing my own thing whenever I want. Why? Well, I'll just get forgiveness. We all joke about it, right? It's easier to get forgiveness than permission, right? That's a very dangerous attitude to bring to God. Now, they go to this extreme because they've seen that loveless rod of God's holiness used in so many churches without hope, without grace, without any emphasis on new life. They've seen somebody just get pounded into the ground with God's standard, screaming ouch the whole time. And what I want to say is those two scenes that I've just painted... Each has missed something precious in the biblical teaching on grace. The the guy that just thumps the standard, here's what God says, and God doesn't change, shape up. He's, He's got an element of truth, but he's still off base. And the guy who says it's just grace, God is love, doesn't matter what you do. You're secure in Jesus. He just washes you clean. Now, that's true too, but it's, but it's not enough of the truth. They're both valid scriptural wings, but each is being used without the other, and the plane will never get off the ground. And so, I want to start... And if I just introduce it, I'm I'm fine with that. We'll just go as long as I need to go on this. I want to start these two or three messages making some things very clear. First, if you are one of the many who has already experienced the pain of living with either an unsaved spouse or have already gone through divorce or have already gone through divorce and remarriage, I would not, for anything, add one ounce of condemnation or pain to your circumstances. And if you brought that to Jesus and you're walking before him in faith, I want you to know that you do not hold some second-class slot in this body of believers. You're not barred from membership or ministry in this church. And your past is erased just like mine is. And so we can join hands together in worship and say, thank you, Jesus. Everybody get that first point? There's more. B, I want to start these messages by also saying this. If you're presently contemplating either of these actions, that is, either marrying an unsaved partner because you're just in love, or divorcing your present partner, the Word of God, Old and New Testament, has serious warnings that you need to hear and you need to listen to. You you need to be reminded that following Jesus means obeying Jesus. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And you need to know that his commands always lead in the path of life and blessing, and you need to know that breaking them always leads to destruction. Those are the two things I want to say. Now, to the subject. 
tonight, marrying unsaved partners. That's what's dealt with in our text. I want you to notice, first of all, that God says this is an abomination. It's called an abomination and it's called a profane act in the same verse. Verse 11, Judah has been faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, the prophet shows this to be wrong on two accounts. He says it's wrong because of the people who the people who committed this sin, because of who they were. In no uncertain terms, uh, we are made aware that Judah has been faithless and an abomination has been committed in Israel. Judah, Israel. And that emphasis is an accidental one. Judah, Israel were a distinct people. They were a separate people. They were a called out people by God. And this distinction, this separateness, it was supposed to mark all of their earthly existence, not just the religious portion of their existence, but everything about them was to be marked as distinct from those who didn't worship their God. Everything they did was to be seen as touched by the ownership of their creator. So, it's a sin on the account of who these people were and what they were called to be. Secondly, it was a sin because of what God had already done for these people. That's the reason for those specific reminders. Judah has been faithless and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Now, notice that specific reference to the city of Jerusalem. If you've been in this series, you'll remember that it's not long that these people have been delivered from Babylonian captivity. Not through military might, not by their own hand. God had sovereignly delivered them and brought them back into the city of Jerusalem. And so in Jerusalem, you're committing this sin. No other nation had been so treated by God's grace. Now, in other words, God had once again proven his faithfulness to the covenant. These were the people of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And God said, I, I made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's why I delivered you out of Babylon and brought you back to Jerusalem. And it's in Jerusalem that you're committing these sins against me? Look around you, God is saying. He hadn't deserted them. He had kept his word. He had kept his covenant. He had shown his kindness and his goodness. But what had his goodness done to their hearts? Remember? Do you remember at the beginning I said, here's what makes grace hard? Because there are people who think that when they're contemplating sin, grace comes into the picture and that means they can go ahead and sin because they're just going to get forgiveness afterwards. God had been so gracious, so faithful to these people. What had his kindness done in their hearts? Had it won their gratitude? Had it made their wills more yielded to his rule? No. It made them more careless. They were more sinful, more cold-hearted in the face of God's kindness to them. God's kindness made them Careless. Put a little red tag by that sentence. We might use it later. God's kindness had made them careless. So God said it was an abomination, and it was an abomination for those two reasons. Now, number two. In marrying pagan wives, they were breaking faith with God, and they were profaning his sanctuary, the text says. That's in verse 11. Judah has been faithless, breaking faith, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. Let me just quickly make clear, maybe this is a good place to say it. The sin God is speaking of in these verses has nothing to do with marrying people of another race. That wasn't the deal. 
The Bible is very clear that many foreigners actually left Egypt with the children of Israel. They could marry any of those as long as those people committed themselves to the worship of the God of Israel. So the sin being dealt with here is a religious sin, not a racial one. The people of Judah were marrying those who had no faith in the true God of Israel. They were marrying people who worshipped other gods. So, that's the sin they were committing. Now jump across the years, and I want you to see how the New Testament picks up this same theme. Marrying people who don't have faith in the living God. What the New Testament does, and it's really interesting, is it gives specific instruction on marrying unbelievers, and it does so from both a before you marry an unbeliever perspective and an after you marry an unbeliever perspective. They're both covered, and it's interesting to see how that works out. Here's the before. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Paul writes and he says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, Satan? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Now, he doesn't answer any of those questions, but he means for us to answer them. And the answer in each case is, well, there's nothing. There's nothing in common. Now, 1 Corinthians 7.39 talks about a situation where a believer and an unbeliever are already married, not someone contemplating it, that's what we just read, but where it's already a done deal. 1 Corinthians 7.39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only, only in the Lord. Now, why does the Bible put such emphasis on this point? Don't marry an unbeliever. I don't know everybody here tonight, but if you're a young adult, a young person, uh, maybe an older person, widow, widower, I hope that, at least in this place, you won't leave without hearing me say to you, don't marry an unbeliever. Did everybody hear that? Don't marry an unbeliever. Why? Why does the Bible put such emphasis at this point, both in our Malachi text and Paul's words in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians? Because because nothing shows the state of your heart more than your choice of a marriage partner. That's it. Nothing shows the state of your heart more than your choice of a marriage partner. Marriage is the fountain of everything else that will come to be of your life. You can't separate it from any of your goals or aspirations. Notice the scope of Paul's question. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And, and Dear one, listen. There's only one correct answer to that question. Absolutely, ultimately, nothing. Oh, Pastor Don, you don't understand. I I know we have some different views on, you know, religion. But that's the only difference. And in that statement, if that's even going through your mind, you've proven to me that you have no understanding of what the Christian life is all about. You're proving that you think the lordship of Jesus just belongs to some religious compartment of your life while the rest of your life is your own. You've moved Christ from the center to the edge of your decision-making process. Yeah, but Pastor Don, we we have so many other things in common. Listen to me. If you're serious about following Jesus, 
apart from some romantic attraction to that other person, you have nothing in common. No, but I really, I just, I just like his sense of humor. Really. Does it, does it glorify Jesus Christ? Well, no, but it's clean. Yeah, but, but you're not interested in just being clean. The passion of your heart is to glorify Jesus Christ. And your unsaved boyfriend or girlfriend can't even relate to that. They can't possibly understand that. No, but Pastor Don, he has, and this, I've heard all these. That's why they're right there. <laughs> Pastor Don, he, he has such a good job. He got really good marks. He's a hard worker. He'll make a good living. Yes, but those things you just listed, not one of those things is the ultimate goal of your life if you're following Jesus. You're not here just trying to save lots of money. You're here to glorify God, to advance the kingdom of God, to reach the lost, to serve the Lord. No, but Pastor Don, he's so much fun to be with, and he may well be. Pursuing fun is all he has to live for. But you're not just here to have fun. You're here to obey and please Jesus, to lay down your life for him and his kingdom, to prepare for eternity. It's not even on his radar screen. And if you don't see those distinctions, then then your interest in this person and you're potentially selecting him or her for your marriage partner, it just shows that you've, you've, for all your talk, you've never really come to terms with what the Christian life is all about. You're just maintaining some kind of a religious system. You're not thinking in terms of new life and Jesus isn't really Lord in your heart. That's the issue you have to come to terms with. Okay, four, the cost of linking your heart with an unbeliever. Malachi 2.12 says, may the, Lord, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this and who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Strange last words. Notice them. Who brings an offering to the Lord of host, hosts. I mean, it's a, it's a telling phrase. These people and I introduced this at the very beginning of this teaching, these people want to pursue their own agenda and their own inclinations in choosing a marriage partner, and then they would like to sustain, come, worship, bring their offering to the Lord in his house. In other words, they want to make their own decision about marriage, and then they want to just assume and expect that as they come into the sanctuary, God will pour out his grace and blessing on their life because after all, they're there in church. And these words are so stern for a very good reason. God wants them to know that their feelings of innocence don't make them innocent. These people knew from square one that marrying pagan partners was strictly forbidden by God. I don't mean to bore you with texts, but let me just read you quickly. Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 4. This is at the very beginning of their sort of establishment as a covenant people of God. They're not even in the promised land yet. Let me just read you. Deuteronomy 7, 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away the many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. You try reading those quickly. Seven nations more numerous and mightier than yourselves. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them. Show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. And then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Wow. 
Now, that's a long and involved quote, but there's a reason it's so important to our study of Malachi. These people, this was not a matter of just falling into sin and finding out that, oh, I guess we displeased the Lord. Rather, they knew all along that what they were doing was wrong. They were, they were planning on rebelling against the Lord, rebelling against the knowledge they had, and then they were going to come and offer sacrifices and offerings. And everything would just be fine. God is love. In other words, they were sinning against clear knowledge. They were presuming on God's grace. And God tells them that they could come into his house, beg for forgiveness, offer sacrifices till the cows came home. And it wouldn't work, God says. It won't work. There is a place for that standard of holiness. I'm talking now to a person who hasn't married an unbeliever yet, but is planning on it. You know better. You've seen what God's word has to say about the subject. And what I'm trying to say in love is if you think you can just go ahead and then eventually with enough praise courses and offerings, you can maybe buy God off with this wonderful Christian life, you're mistaken. You're, 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 you're right on the edge of short-circuiting your walk with the Lord. Lastly and really quickly, Remember I said there are two sides. What if I've already committed this sin? First Corinthians seven twelve to 16 says, To the rest I say, I, not the Lord. What he means by that, by the way, is not that what he's saying isn't true, but there's a lot of things Paul repeated that he heard Others testify and tradition about what the Lord had said. And he says, this is just, I'm telling you this as an apostle. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, okay, so now I'm in the situation. She consents to live with him. He should not divorce her. Any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her. She should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. I'll, I'll talk about that later on. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. It's an interesting verse too. 15. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? Okay, the, there are a lot of details in there, but the bottom line is an, a believer and an unbeliever. And, and Paul speaks to the believer and says, you, you stay there. You just stay right there. This is so important. This is an abiding spiritual principle is this. Whatever situation you're in right now, God's grace is always activated by genuine repentance in the same way that his wrath is activated by presumption. In other words, the person who plans to sin, relying on God's forgiveness at a later date, will meet nothing but ruin. The person who has committed sin and comes to God with a contrite, humble heart finds cleansing and new hope. And if the church ever just says one of those things, she misses telling people the whole truth. They're not new truths. And they require deep and careful listening. I've actually come a full circle to wrap this up right where I started. The church always has two messages to proclaim at the same time, and she never honors her Lord if she just proclaims one. My heart goes out to people who never knew this truth or who have foolishly rebelled against it and have joined their lives to an unbeliever. Or perhaps they were both unbelievers, and then one came to the Lord, so you still have a believer and an unbeliever. 
The Bible makes its point clear. Stay with your partner. I know, I know that takes special grace at times. That's what, that's what God provides. Love and honor him or her just as much as you can. Pray much. Don't scold or lecture. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in your life. Get other believers to covenant with you in constant prayer. Be faithful as you can in God's house and never, never, never lose hope in what God's mighty grace can do in your situation. How do you know, Paul says? Your unbelieving husband might be sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife might be sanctified by the husband. Never give up on God's grace. So those are the two things. Never presume on God's grace. I know this is wrong, but shoot, everybody's doing it, and I'll get God's grace after. Mm -mm, that won't work. That won't, that won't work. If you're in the situation, never give up on God's grace. It's powerful, abiding, miracle-working, and sustaining. And as long as you keep both those sides together, the church won't go off the rails on this subject. And everyone said...